The dawn of civilization. Primitive. Dangerous. Exciting. The handwriting is on the wall. If the human race is ever going to amount to anything, it needs... The most civilized caveman I have ever seen. Ah, oh, look who's come out of his cave. You're listening to the Knuckle Drags Extravaganza on Z Digital. If you're joining us live or via the uh, magic of the internet, listening in to Cave Dweller Music, it's Matt here, and I'm going to be having a chat to a gentleman that put out a record we've been playing quite a fair bit of. You may have seen the review for it on the new releases show or on the Cave Dweller Music site itself. We're going to be having a chat to George from uh, Basel. First and foremost, thank you for taking some time out and having a chat to us. How's it going? Good. Always good here. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. As I mentioned, uh, In the Shallows of the Starlit Lake came out a little bit earlier on in the year. And I think from memory, it was probably one of the first records that I listened to all year because it was the 23rd of January that it came out, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, if memory serves, which it doesn't be yet. That's right. Look, I uh, I sometimes forget what date it is. Um, and, you know, trying to do the show doesn't exactly help. but. Um, the one thing that I was really excited to see is, as I mentioned, new release of show, we did a little bit for it. Uh, Cave Dweller Music had a bit for it as well. But there seems like a universal positive reaction to the record. How have you found it on your end? Yeah, everything's been really positive, which is um, interesting. We don't often get that reaction. So, yeah, we kind of we kind of do our own thing and... Things don't seem to ever sound the same as they did before, so there's there doesn't seem to be like a vase or style. But um, everybody's been yeah really really good about this release. It's surprising. Now Even I got puppets, which yeah. really nice to look for. <laughs> I got really nerdy um, when I was listening to it and when I was reviewing it because I had it in this mind that you've set up this. It's the idea of uh, the chariot and the charioteer, right? Like you've got the the unruly horse, the well-trained horse, and the charioteer that's controlling the whole thing. Because, yes, a lot of it was that classic raw black metal, like really fast, really aggressive. The guitars turn into buzzsaws more than anything else. But underneath, there were little smatterings of like dungeon synth and more atmospheric sounds. And I know re- reading interviews with you guys that that was kind of, you wanted to go back to that classic black metal sound. How did you find it going? And like you said, everything that Vorzor does is a, a little bit different. How was the approach for this one here? Uh, yeah, so it was more. So the last album, we we kind of pushed it as far as we could in terms of layers and technicality and that sort of stuff. Um and and song structures even so they were they were really loose and really long songs and it was you know really hard to record um so you know after that session we went I, oh well I think I went I'm not doing that again um <laughs> we, we got to do something different next time because I'm not doing nine minute songs again um so this time it, you know we kind of all felt like the right way to go was back to where we started so we you know if you listen to one of our first demos was a black resplendent waters demo so it was pretty straightforward songs um you know not that many riffs in a song but good riffs or we think they're good riffs um so we we kind of all agreed that that's the direction we wanted to go and to to focus on strong riffs lots we like lots of layers we do melody and harmony we think pretty well um and uh but relatively simple riffs so you can you know you can hear things if there's a lot going on but there's a lot of different elements in there so yeah that was kind of the approach this time and i think it paid off dividends because there are really solid really straightforward riffs but then they're offset and they're counterbalanced by these melodies that you don't hear the first couple of times through like they're sitting there in the back of your head yeah yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I'll still listen to things now that – so I wrote some of the music, but Scott wrote the majority of the music and he basically just does that in his lounge room and records it and then adds layers and, you know, then we'll, later on we'll record it properly. Um, 
but I, yeah, I still hear things, well, you know, not now that I've listened to it a hundred times after the mixing process, but, um, you know, there were things that I was like, oh, I didn't hear that the first time. That's, you know, a surprise. It's new. So. And it seems like a pretty re- rewarding listen then if you who, are, you know, are in the band have, you know, listened to those songs countless times, you're still picking up those little bits and pieces. Mm. Yeah. Like one of my favourite sections is at the end of um, – the, the Gaslight song, the first song, um, and multiple layers, heavily influenced by Iron Maiden. Um, yeah, but awesome. Just really cool stuff in there. And that's the thing that I really like about reading interviews that you have guys done, posts that you guys have done. You're not shy about talking about your influences. You know, a lot of bands can go, you know, no, 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 this is, this is something brand new that we're thinking about. You guys kind of go, no, nah, man, we, we like Iron Maiden. We think, you know, we love this one style. This is our love letter to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We are um, influenced by a bunch of different stuff. Most of it's old school stuff because we're old. We've been doing this for 30 years. but Comes with um, the territory, I suppose, hey? Yeah. But, we, yeah, we love those bands. Like even, you know, bands like um, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, like I say and Scott, will vehemently disagree with me on this, but I say that Def Leppard's Hysteria is the best album ever recorded because of the layers. Um, But, yeah, that's just me. That seems like an interesting dynamic in the band, but you hit on something there that I really like is even in something that you don't particularly like for whatever stylistic reason, you can still pull the positives out of something, you know? Like there's there's something in there that you can kind of go, Oh, I see why they've done that. I really like what they've done. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, Like, I don't get into too much death or black metal. I'm not a major fan of tech death metal, but, you know, those things were present in the last album. Um, So we we pushed um, some of the technical aspects of the music as far as we could. But that's kind of what we try and do. We we integrate our influences, but in our way. And so one of the other things that I noticed reading interviews with you guys is, and we mentioned this before we started recording, is it almost works in sets of three, right? Like the record releases and the sort of sounds. If the last one was Tech Death and this one was going back to the more straightforward black metal, I read somewhere that there was an EP that was written last year. Is this sort of going to be the new trajectory? Uh, to go to this more straightforward, simple but done well. Yep. In short, yes. And primarily because we, for the last album and albums before that, we we went to studios and we did um, recordings in studios and had limited time because, you know, we're not wealthy, we're not Metallica, we can't spend nine months in the studio. So it was really kind of this compressed, get all your ideas out and as quickly as possible, and then, you know, it, it's done. Um, with this one, we tinkered a lot more in, in the recording process and we enjoyed that a lot. So, you know, we'd go away and listen to it and then, you know, Scott or I would say, I want to come back and, you know, add this vocal bit here that we hadn't planned at all in the songwriting process. Um, and Scott would re-record the acoustic guitar parts because, you know, I gave him one of the mics, so he would change it slightly and it added this new dynamic. And I, I think it resulted in a much better album. Um, and so, yes, in short, <laughs> the long way to the short answer is yes, the next EP is written technically, as in um, it, it's on paper, but my guess is it will sound nothing like we think it will sound after we have a chance to record it and play with it and tinker and add things that we didn't think about when we were writing. Does doing it yourself give you more breathing room than what you would being uh, subjected to someone else's timeline? Like you mentioned there, you're able to tinker with it, change it on the fly. Does it also give not only the breathing room, but you a chance to step back and look at it as it's growing. Yep, and critically. So you can say, look, that bit is just shit. It's not going to work. So you take it out or you rewrite it or, you you know, you you 
do something else. Um, yeah, so one of the bass lines that I recorded for the, the last album, um, Starlit Lake album, I didn't like it at all. So I took it out, rewrote it, re-recorded the whole song. The, you mentioned there the cost, you know, you're not, you're not Metallica, you don't have time to sit there for nine months in a studio. Did the cost to record this recent record end up being equivalent to a carton of Jack Daniels, a carton of Smokes, and uh, what was the other one here, uh, and an $80 interface? Yep. I love that. <laughs> <That's>... sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Which, we... And look, and the price of Smokes are going continually up and up, so, you know, if, if this gets brought back up in five years, people will be going, shit, these blokes must have money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, but we can't record drums in a, in, a, in somebody's lounge room, sort of. We, <laughs> we um, so the drums were recorded at, at a friend of our studio, um, and because they're a friend, they did it on the cheap. Um, and Brandon basically just paid them in in Jack Daniels and cigarettes. And what studio did you guys record at, by the way, um, for those drums at the very least? Uh, I think it's Hellfire Studio. It's Bo Remy. Um, mm. So he's in, been in the industry for years or in the scene for years. Um, yeah, and he, he and Brandon were quite close at the time. And um, yeah, he did the drums for us. Nicely done. One of the sites that I um, was seeing a whole bunch of positive love from uh, is Black Metal Daily. Are you involved with those guys as well? Uh, I used to write a lot of reviews for them, but kind of got burnt out of review writing. Um, I know and- that feeling all too well. Because <laughs> you get, I don't know whether you experience this as well, but you get the weird mental hang up of not being able to turn that critical part of your brain off and go, oh, this is a really good record. You're sitting yeah. there thinking, all right, how would I describe this? What words am I going to use? What sort of, what theme am I going to use for this review? Yeah, and, uh, exactly. And, and what's new? Um, what's different? And you know, I just found a lot of the stuff um, that was coming out sounded really, really similar um, and was, you know, tough to dissect because, uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard it last week. So, um, I, yeah, I kind of, I, I still do occasionally, but, not very often anymore. Um, so yeah, I know I know Aaron um, and some of the other guys who write for the for the site, um, but I haven't written for them in quite a while now. So was it just a case of you were listening to too much music, or you were putting too much pressure on yourself to listen to a whole bunch of new music? A bit of both. Um, you know, I wanted to produce for them, and I was writing for another site too. Um, so, yeah, I felt kind of guilty, like I should be contributing. Um, but, I, yeah, I just couldn't do it anymore because the reviews. So when I put my name on something, I like to know or I like to think that it's 100% of the effort that I can do at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and I didn't just want to write shit and reviews and what you, just your stock standard reviews. So, um, yeah. My cardinal sin is, and this is – maybe a bit of ego on my part, but if I know a major record's going to come out, I'll look at what other people have written about it. And you can almost always hit three or four lines that are going to be, you know, the storyline for whatever this record is. And it sounds like you've done this as well, where you put that challenge to yourself to go, okay, this is what the general consensus is of the record. How can I phrase it in a way that's not me just copy paste and manipulating the same shit well yeah well, well that's what that's what kind of came out with the reviews of our stuff is you know the record company asked us to write a bit of a piece about it so they could use it for marketing um and all those reviews were quoting the stuff that we wrote and i'm just like that's just lazy reviewing so like i i like to be i like to tear albums apart even if they're good um but also try and be funny as well. Um, so I wrote a review of Dark Funerals, and I, I quite liked it. The drum sound was terrible, but um, quite liked the album. But you know, they they also produced this bar of soap. Um, Wait, what? Dark Funeral yeah. has soap. 
Yeah, yeah. It was Lord Atherman's um, makeup as as the soap. <laughs> And so, you know, the last line of the review is something like, you know, I don't think you've thought this through because you're literally going to be cupping a bunch of guys' balls and with your face. <laughs> so, you know, it was that kind of thing. But it, I, I find reviews really disappointing and people, you know, I've read reviews or been told about reviews where the person couldn't tell the difference between a guitar and a keyboard. Um and I'm like, well, you shouldn't be reviewing then. That's what are you doing? Um, and you know, this bands I think, you know, like Dark Throne, for example, I really like Dark Throne's old stuff. Mm. Like stuff. those first three records, perfect. Like can't yeah. fault them. Yeah. But their new stuff's garbage. It's pieced together in a couple of days and recorded and I hate it. That's there my was, opinion. was it the one Astral Fortress, like the Doom one that they did recently. I didn't mind that, but then they went through that weird crust punk phase and I'm sitting there going, what the fuck is this? Where's the seven-minute songs, the scary tremolo guitar and this banshee howling in my face? I don't want to, like, I don't want to listen to it. Like, I don't listen to crust punk at the best of times. Why the fuck would I listen to it if it has Dark Throne stick it on it? Yeah, and and that's like that. I... I don't like a lot of their new stuff. I, it's their band. They can do whatever they want. Um, it's much like our band. We do what we want and get criticised for it. That's fine. Um, but I think people buy it because of the name rather than that it's actually good music. I mean, Sorry to the Dark Throne fans. <laughs> <laughs> but you do notice that, though, when bands hit a certain... I wouldn't say time, but they hit a certain status where they can release anything and people still go great you know it's it's the next step yeah another band that was so fucking guilty of that like and i grew up early 2000s you know early 2010s and that was a time where listening to green day you know you you weren't as shunned for it but as soon as american idiot came out i think they kind of just went we've got a formula you know, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll color we'll color by numbers for the next 10, 15 years and and retire on multiple multiple millions of dollars. And like like you said, all the props to them. But after a while, you kind of go, yeah, this is just shit. Yeah, heaps of bands do it. Like Metallica did it. Like that Lucy thing that they released. Oh, yeah. Was that a, why would you do that? Like Behemoth, for example, I, I think they've gone very formulaic and, you know, I don't understand why they released that weird EP that was one new song in re-recordings or live songs. It's, what are you doing? What, what's the point? Why are you in a country and western band? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's lost the plot, <laughs> but that's just me as well. Uh, you mentioned there um, the record label and I have been... I don't want to say one of the biggest supporters, but three of my albums of the year last year all came through Bitter Loss Records. Um, I was lucky enough to chat to Rob late last year, saw a whole bunch of them play in Brisbane early this year. How have you found the dealings with them? From my understanding with you guys, it started out as a distro deal and knowing him, he just has this, I must give back to this underground scene as much as possible. And it seems like, the energy for you from your band and what he's trying to do just meshed really well. Yeah. I So I don't do a lot of the stuff around um, the marketing or the negotiations with the labels or anything like, like that. Like the businessy anymore. side of it, yeah. Yeah. That's that's the guitarist. He's, he's quite passionate about that sort of stuff. I did it a lot when we were a newer band. Um, but yeah. the roles have kind of transitioned now. Just to um, put a pin in that, though, and we'll double back to the bit of loss, but was it a similar thing with your reviewing? Did you just find it burnt you out and it kind of sucked the fun out of it? Because rather yeah. than going, yeah, this is a great band, i got to have fun with my mates, you kind of sit there and think, I'm a business now. I need to treat this like a business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've... We've had some interesting record deals. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try not to talk shit about too many people, but... 
I'll just put a pinch harmonic over the top of whatever you start going off on. Oh, before Bitter Loss, the two labels that we were with, um, you know, were, I I didn't, I wasn't impressed with them, to be honest. Um, You know, people can go look up those labels, but the one before Bitter Loss sat on our album for two years, even though in the contract it said that it'd start marketing the album within three months of receiving it. Um, the the guy before that, so the label before, ignored our emails for six months, saying, "You know what's happening? What what's the updates?" And they just didn't reply at all. Um, yeah, so the new deal, the, you know, with Rob Rob's a breath of fresh air. Yeah, like I said, I've um, I've had a chat to a fair few of your label mates and they've had nothing but positive things. The best story out of that was he flew over to Brizzy for Malignant Aura's debut show. And like, I, as soon as I heard that, I was like, this guy, they, it, it, like, like we said before, it's not just a business to him. It's something that he's genuinely keen on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's in the scene, definitely. He does it because he loves it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, and you mentioned Dark Throne there before, but there is something that your band does which I find very interesting. And is it that you don't play live shows, or it's just a preference that you're not keen on playing live? Like how do how do you square that? Um. Theoretically, we don't play live shows. <laughs> it, for, for, we did it for years. Like, as, as I said, we've been doing this for 30 years since we were mm. 16 years old. We've done live shows. Metal shows are the most bizarre um, in, in the sense that you can turn up. Like, so we live in the country. So it's it's at least a half hour, an hour and a half drive to melbourne for us um then you sit around for hours and then you play for 30 to 45 minutes and then you wait till the end of the night and then you drive home an hour and a half so it's a long long day either way you can play to 10 people or you can play to 150 people um and you just can't tell so for us you know I've, i've got a family i've got a job um it's just not worth the time for me. It's a young man's game. So um, if somebody wants to pay me, like guarantee me that I'll earn a thousand bucks for the trip, then sure, I'll do it. But when you earn less money than the time and petrol it costs, like we've played gigs and we have literally used the money to buy McDonald's after the gig and that was all the money gone. Yeah. It's not worth it. And like you said, an hour and a half drive to get into Melbourne, you're sitting around like a stale bottle of piss because you've had to load in, you've got, you know, X, Y, Z. And then these gigs don't finish till, what, 11, 11.30 at night. So you're not getting home until basically the next day. And like you said, you've got a family. And after a while, you kind of just go, nah, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's it's, it's fun. But in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, I've done it. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> I served my time earning no money and waiting. <laughs> was. I like that. So, and the thing that I really like about your approach, and this is something that I can tell, is uh, Vazor is uh, it's not a labor of love because that's not the correct term for it. It's just a good creative outlet for you i was going to say creative hobby yeah. but i've i've gone through some of the pictures on your uh on your facebook and it seems like woodworking is more a creative hobby for you <laughs> yeah. yeah woodworking yeah so yeah that's my side hustle is um i yeah i slab trees and make tables out of them um that can earn you some money Oh, um, I can imagine it would. Look, you go to any sort of like rustic cabin in the woods and and you know that they've got a slabbed tree table. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they do. <laughs> but yeah, we we do the band because we like it. Like that's and that's why we're not kind of beholden to any major record labels or anything like that. So we don't have to produce, you know, this formulaic release each time we can do we can explore. We're, you know, 30 years in and we're still kind of exploring what sounds we can make and what songs we can write and 
um, yeah, so we do what we want in the band. And there's been quite a few name changes as well from the early days until now. Does that name change follow along that sort of three record or or three release cycle? Name changes with the band or mm. with no, so we we underwent a bunch of name changes when we were young. Um but every release since nineteen ninety three or four has had Vazor as the band name. Um, so yeah, we just basically were trying to find a name when we were young. We even did the stupid shit of you know saying, "Oh, we'll be the band without a name." Um, at one point, well, how does that work out? How can you be a band without a name? You can't now. Record label. <laughs> <laughs> the record you label. That. That's idiotic. You're not doing it. <laughs> you learned that quick smart. You're like, "We're the band without the name," and the label just looks at you like, "You fucking what?" <laughs> Well, we were kids, you know. You don't, you do stupid shit when you were a kid. So. Exactly. Have you seen? Obviously, you know you've been doing this since you were sixteen. How have you seen yourself grow alongside the music? Do you feel like it reflects your listening habits and sort of how you're going creatively at each period of time? Do you get much time to look back on the older records? Um, not really. Um, you kind of. I don't know, you know, how many of your listeners uh, play in bands, but part of the process of writing songs and albums is it's really long for us. Um, so it takes a long time to write songs, but then it takes a long time to record songs and mix songs. And so you listen to them, you know, probably close to between 50 and 100 times um, over the process. So I just don't listen to our stuff anymore. <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. Occasionally, I'll go and listen to, you know, a song and go, oh, yeah, that's what we sounded like back then. But that's about it. Um, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't stomach it a lot. After, like, I haven't listened to the new album in, I don't know, six months, something like that. And like, you put it really well. Like, you've been listening to this thing for the entire writing, mixing, mastering. And then, yeah. you know, a final, a final once over, you might have like, you know, a listen on the day that it comes out, but you've listened to those songs more than more than what most people would in such a condensed amount of time that you kind of go, ah, oh, no, I'm, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've had enough of this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of, I have, you know, I remember our stuff for the most part. Mm. Um, so it's... In the sense that I, I think obviously we have grown, we've grown as musicians, and you know I think Scott's probably one of the better guitarists and composers of songs and riffs in in Australia. But obviously I'm probably biased there. Um, so, but he's definitely gotten better. But I think he, you know, he listens to a lot of stuff, everything from you know Ingve Marstein to Impaled Nazarene, sort of a thing. Um, so all these things kind of get chucked in a, a bit of a melting pot and see what happens, what comes out. Well, it's like we were talking before with um, you thinking that Def Leppard record's the best of all time. You kind of you pick little bits and pieces out of things that you like and then you throw them all together. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So we mentioned there that there was uh, an EP written last year Um Outside the release of this record, what else have you got lined up for the remainder of 2023? We haven't started recording the EP yet. <laughs> it's written. Um, but I think Scott needs to decompress after. So he was primarily responsible for recording the whole thing and mixing the whole thing. Um, yeah, so he'll he'll get started on basically developing click tracks and um, then putting down a, what, what we call a ghost guitar track. So it's not necessarily the final guitar track or one of the guitar tracks, but it's there so the drummer knows where to play and where not to play, and then they'll go away and record the drum. So that'll, that'll happen this year sometime. Um, I don't know when, but Scott's also writing 
um, a, a really long non-linear song. He's calling it. Um, so I don't know what All that's right. going. Um, yeah, what's well, oh, something to keep an eye out for? Again, yeah. I really appreciate you taking out the time and having a chat to us. Uh, if people wanted to get in contact, check out your music hit you up whereabouts or what's the best way for them to go do so obviously not at a live show because that's not happening <laughs> well, unless somebody chucks some money at us um, <laughs> we're doing the black metal scene is just not going to happen um probably facebook is the best i think we've, we've got an instagram page as well but facebook is um scott monitors that pretty pretty well and pretty frequently responds to people um, on the site um other than that, I don't, I don't really know. I think Facebook's it, really. That's a good way to go. And I mean, you know, and if you guys get a, a few thousand more streams, you might be able to split a, a $4 coffee between the three of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Again, really appreciate you uh, taking the time out. And, of course, to you, dear listener, make sure you go listen to In the Shallows of a Starlit Lake. We'll be playing a couple of tracks for this one uh, on the show either side of the interview so it's a nice bookend but again thank you very much for taking some time out and having a chat to us pleasure